got your Bibles, we'll be in uh, Acts chapter 13 tonight. Acts chapter 13, continuing our uh, sermon series out of the uh, book of Acts. A series I've entitled Church on the Move. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 13, the first uh, 12 verses here. Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read these first 12 verses, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll get into the message uh, this evening. So Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and uh, Simon that uh, was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, and they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence uh, they sailed to Cyprus, and when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they were gone through the island unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for uh, so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Uh, then Saul, who is uh, called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and he said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. The title of the message tonight is Missions in Action. Missions in Action. We're going to... Uh, pray and uh, uh, get into the Word tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this this evening, God. I pray that uh, You can uh, have free reign tonight. I pray You would bind Satan and, and bind all distractions. God, I pray You'd help me to preach like a dying man to dying people and uh, help me to say what You want said. God, we need You to work in this hour. God, we don't have revival just by uh, uh, entertainment or excitement. Um, it starts with prayer. It starts with uh, us being willing to have the finger pointed at us tonight. God, I pray you'd work in our service. I pray that even here on uh, on a night like tonight that uh, we can have revival break out like we've had before on some Sunday nights where uh, people just get, get things right with you is the only way I know how to put it, God. I pray you'd use this message that uh, the reading of your word would draw people closer together and that you'd be honored and glorified. By all that's said and done, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So 97% of the people in the world have heard of Coca-Cola. 72% of all the people in the world have seen a can of Coca-Cola. 52, or excuse me, 51% of the world have tasted Coke out of a Coke can. And at the time that these stats were done was in 1984 when Coke had only been around 80 years. If God has given the task of world evangelism to the Coca-Cola company, it would have been done by now. Something to think about how Coke has gotten their brand and they've gotten their product all around the world. There's so, several franchises like that, McDonald's, KFC, you can see them in other countries. In fact, I went on a missions trip when I was 19 to Guatemala. I uh, ate at a uh, McDonald's in Guatemala City. The scary thing about that is it tastes exactly like the McDonald's here. <laughs> kind of scary. A one-legged school teacher from Scotland came to J. Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary, to offer himself for service in China. So J. Hudson Taylor said, With one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? You only have one leg. Why, why are you wanting to do this? George Scott was this man's 
name. And he, George, George Scott said, I do not see those with two legs going. And you know what? Because of his testimony, George Scott was accepted to go and help on the mission field with J. Hudson Taylor. Doing missions isn't an easy thing tonight. And we think of missions, we think of uh, missionaries that we get support for and we raise funds for just like we do it uh, during the Lottie Moon offering. We raise those funds and, and, and we get those funds, which 100% of that goes to a missionary on a foreign field. And, and a lot of times those missionaries are, are in places where they're dark. And when I say they're dark, I'm not talking about the... The, the skylight is dark. I'm talking about there's places that are spiritually dark. If you mention a Bible, people are like, what's that? Or if you talk about Jesus, they're like, who is He? Uh, they, they go to places where there's no concept of those places, of those things. Uh, we also think of missionaries that go to China and they, they put themselves on the front lines, if you will, and uh, they, they sometimes risk it all. And they go there, and then I've heard stories about guys that that go and then they get off on the airplane. They get a bunch of guys put them in a van and they drive them to a, 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 a unmarked building somewhere in the town and there's one light bulb right in the middle of the room because they don't want to draw too much attention to themselves. And just like some of those stories that, that, that are neat to listen to and hear, maybe missions in action isn't just something that goes on uh, in Beijing or in uh, Panama. We talked about a, a brother that's uh, serving in Panama and he's got some camps going, about sending our VBS uh, offering to. Those aren't the only places where missions need to be in action. It also needs to be right here in Christian County, right here in this community that we're situated in between Ozark and Sparta. We've got two communities. And I had a, a, a dear brother tell me there's a lot of Baptist churches around here. There's actually three just on this road. But you know what, friend? There's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus. And I would add to that, that if everybody in Ozark and Sparta got up on a Sunday morning and said, we're going to go to church, if everybody got up to do that, guess what? There would not be enough seating for everybody in our local churches if everybody in Sparta and Ozark decided to get up and go to church. And then you got some that are just in the outskirts of town. There's a lot of people, they've never heard a gospel presentation. They may have heard about church, they may have heard people talk about Jesus, but they've never heard a clear-cut gospel presentation where they're born as a sinner. and something a lot of people don't like to hear. But we've got to hear that, and we've got to accept that before we can accept the good news. We can't just give the positive news. Missions in action just isn't the positive news. And in the reading we just read, before we go back over it, it wasn't an easy thing for them to go and do. They, they had opposition here from that sorcerer. If I take a car, and your car needs to be jump-started, and I always, my dad taught me a long time ago, you carry a pair of good jumper cables with you. I've got the same jumper cables I've had since I was 16. And those jumper cables, they work. That thing's built really good. Because you, can, you might need help, or you can help somebody else. Now, if I said, I don't want to be a negative person, all I'm going to do is hook up your positive terminals, you would look at me and say, Brother Josh, you are nuts, you have lost it. You've got to look up the positive and the negative. So what do we see about this missions in action? What can we learn tonight about this missions in action? A couple things. Number one, our first point for study tonight, we see the starting point. We see, number one, the starting point back here, verse 1 in the first part of verse 2. Now they were at the church that was at Antioch, and, and, and that ought to be, uh, be a, a, an attention getter for us because that church at Antioch was, was, was not just... Oh, they, they just opened their doors and, and turned the lights on. Those people were the ones that were first called Christians. And they were called little Christ because everything they believed, everything they taught, it made a difference there. So it says, now there in the, the church was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. This church at Antioch had become a home base for missions. We see an emphasis here on the local church. That Greek word, some of you might be familiar with it, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, which means out of, and uh, to call the church is an assembly of people brought together for a single 
purpose. I find it funny that there's a churches that will start and they'll say this is the satanic church. Because church also means that which belongs to God. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the satanic church. Okay, you're saying you belong to Satan, but you're also saying you're a gathering that belongs to God? That doesn't, that doesn't compute with me. Biblically speaking, the church is a called out assembly of baptized believers, purchased by the blood and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The church is also defined, like we said, as that which belongs to God. So we see here the local church, but we see here church growth. We see some people here that are called prophets and teachers. And we need to understand here about these guys with, that with Acts as a transitional book, there are no more prophets. There are, no, there are teachers, but there are no more prophets. If somebody gets on the TV late at night on the higher cable television channels and says, I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, they don't fit what would be a, a, a job description for a prophet. That doesn't happen anymore. There's no more prophets, there's no more apostles. You're better off just turning the TV off and just reading your Bible. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12 says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Prophets gave revelation, and teachers gave interpretation and understanding. So today we have people that God wants to use in a church to give understanding. Most of the people, by the way, they say, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet. There's a problem there. It's called I and Ivis. It's about them. And usually it's about making the money, the money, making the dollar, the coin of the realm. I remember one guy got up on TV one night. I was flipping through channels when I was, a, when I was younger. I was a teenager, I think. And, and, and it was all about send this money. And he had this number at the bottom of the screen. And he's, he's, it, It's all about him. It, he doesn't even have a Bible open. He has some pictures that look like something from the Middle East behind him. But there wasn't anything about Jesus except for when he had a prayer and he just kind of stuck Jesus into the prayer a little bit. He's trying to make money. Cyrus is mentioned here. He was from Africa. So Antioch was a church of diverse backgrounds. So you had a guy from Africa. You had Barnabas. You had who else here? You had Manian. You had uh, Lucius of Cyrene. I mentioned, I think I said Cyrus. I meant Lucius. I read his name wrong. Uh, so you have all these people here. They're, they're from different backgrounds. Not just ethnicities. It's different backgrounds. All these people here probably had very little in common. But they had one thing in common. Their passion to share the gospel and their passion for people to understand better who Jesus is and how He could change their lives. You know, we're going to have a, I don't know when we're going to do it, but, but we're going to have a testimony and praise night here. And I'm going to bring some people in to share testimonies. I guarantee you there's some of these people, they're dear friends of mine. We came from different sides of the tracks. Drugs, alcohol. I could not tell you the difference between street drugs and vitamins at the Dollar General store. But you know what? Those people that are from the different side of the tracks, we served the same Savior. We both had to be saved. We both had to have an encounter where Jesus came in and changed the direction of our path. Proverbs 29.18 it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law is happy. Or happy is he, excuse me. For where there is no vision, the people perish. A lot of guys will use that to try to talk about a vision they have for a ministry or a church. But, but the primary application here is not so much, well, I'm going to use this verse to proclaim some title I want to use to, to talk about the next year. It's about the revelation of God is what he's talking about where there is no vision. We've got to keep publishing the Word. How do we publish the Word? By talking about Jesus. By getting out here and inviting people to church. By trying to disciple people. But some of the messages we put on the signs. We don't put those messages up because we need something to do with the sign. We put those messages up because we want to draw people to the Lord. <laughs> this isn't about having a vision with dreams and personal goals. It is about the Word of God giving us perspective. The disciples... Were called Christians first at Antioch. Clearly, their walk matched their talk. 
We should love missions like this church did. This church loved missions. And you know, they, they, they sent out the best of the best. They didn't say, well, we're going to hold back Barnabas because he's such an encouragement to me. I don't want Barnabas to go anywhere. They let the best go. They sent the best of the best. They didn't hold anything back. In Acts chapter 11, we were all went over this some time ago, but listen carefully. It says, The tidings of these things come into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. And when he was come, or excuse me, and when he came, uh, he had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all with the purpose of heart. They would cleave to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to to Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You know what? It would be real tempting for me to say, Don't go anywhere, Barnabas. Stay here. I need your encouragement. Be easy to say that, but they sent him out. Barnabas was an encouraging and equipping member of the church. This man, if there, there's a motto that a lot of churches use, this man lived up to that, and that motto is this, every member a minister. Not just the pastor, not just the minister of music, not just the children's church director, not just the Sunday school director, but every member being a minister. That's how Barnabas served. I believe he did that. We see here church prayer and fasting. We see here that in the last this middle part of verse 2, that they prayed, or they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. So there's prayer here. They ministered to the Lord. What does that mean? Where's the Lord at so I can minister to Him, you might ask? It means to draw near to God and to worship Him. It means humbly serving needs. This would be taking on what is important to God. We can't do that without starting with prayer. These people prayed together. They sought the mind of God. They had an urgency to seek God in a special way. You want to minister to God tonight? I think anybody would say, I want to minister to God. How can I minister to God? God wants you to minister to the Lord. He wants you to minister to Him. You may say, what do I have to offer? It's not about what you have to offer. It's about a perspective on what's important to him. We had a VBS uh, meeting before church. Those kids in our community are important to God. So by having a meeting and getting being all in on what we can do for our VBS that's coming up in July, that's ministering to the Lord. When you go visit somebody that's a homebound member of our church that can't get out, You're ministering to the Lord. Yeah, you're ministering to that person, but you're ministering to the Lord because you're taking on something that's important to God. When you open up your Bible and you open up our discipleship lesson and you you talk to somebody about those things in our discipleship lesson, you're ministering to the Lord because you're taking on something that's important to Him. I heard a children's evangelist named Ed Dunlop who once said, when you minister to children, you're ministering to the Lord Jesus Himself. And you may say, what did he mean when he said that he meant children are important to the Lord? So when you're doing something that's important to the Lord, you're ministering to Him. That's how you can minister to the Lord. You don't have to go to a seminary or Bible college to to learn how to minister to the Lord. Just look at what's important to Him. Well, how do I know what's important to Him? Get into the Word. First of all, it's people that are important. I heard one preacher say, and he was joking, he said the ministry would be an easy place if it wasn't for the people. Ministry is people work, not paperwork. These people prayed together and they sought the mind of God and they had an urgency to seek God in a special way. David Gusick, who authors Enduring Word Commentary, said this. He said, this is the first job of any servant to God to minister unto the Lord. 2 Peter 2, 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And here's the part, a peculiar people. We're to be peculiar that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Sometimes if we're not careful, I've been guilty of this. That's why I got together as many people as I could the other day and we went and just canvassed. If we're not careful, we can make the Great Commission the Great Omission. If we're not careful. 
who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Has the Lord, has the Lord Jesus Christ made a difference for you? I hope that He has. You know what's going to grow any church? It's really going to be word of mouth. If you talk to, if you take a survey of most people in most churches, it's usually because somebody invited them. It's not just, well, we drove by and saw some event going on. It's usually there was some relationship. There's someone invited them. So we see secondly here, the second thing about missions being in service, not just the, the sending place, but we see the separation for service. Look at verse 2 with me. We're going to pick up where we left off. It says, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had prayed and fasted, or when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. The laying on of hands doesn't transfer the Holy Ghost into somebody. Rather, it just symbolizes a call that's already happened. These people were called by the Holy Spirit. The call was heard because everyone had put themselves here in a position to hear from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not shout over the world or our pride. If I've got pride in my heart, Holy Ghost isn't going to just try to overpower that. Because the way the Holy Ghost operates is that He's meek. He's waiting for you and I to be willing to take our hands off. You know, I mentioned this morning the idea of a fresh surrender. When was the last time we just took our life and just made it a blank check? It said, Where, wherever, whatever you want me to do, Lord. The Holy Spirit will not shout over the world or our pride, but because these people put themselves in a position to hear Him, they heard the loud, the call loud and clear without any doubts. Linda's graciously put together, was it a prayer guide you said? 14, 14, 14 days before VBS. 14 days before VBS. I'm, I'm, I'm already wanting to get a hold of that prayer guide. Because you know what? I've got to get started praying for that. We aren't going to see God show up and do anything if we aren't looking for Him. And we've got to start praying. Prayer doesn't instantaneously change and create a utopia. But prayer helps us put on our spiritual glasses so we can see God working. I know my life, I failed to see God working, not because God failed to do something, but because I wasn't putting myself in that position to hear from God. I was too wrapped up in myself. I was too prideful. I was too focused on my little self. Instead of just saying, God, lift, I'm lifting this up to you. Tell you what, in the last three years, I've had some situations go on where I've just had to say, God, I'm lifting this up to you. I don't even know how to pray for it, but I know it needs to be prayed for. I've had to do that with a situation this week. God, here it is. I don't know how to pray for it, but I know it needs to be prayed for. John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus speaking says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is not expedient for you that I go away, or that it is, excuse me, it is expedient for, expedient for you if I go away. He's saying this is going to benefit you if I get out of the way. How does this benefit us if Jesus is getting out of the way? Can you imagine being there? Well, it's easy for us because we've seen after that. But can you imagine following Jesus? You're going everywhere He's going. You're seeing Him heal people. And He says, I've, I've got to get out of the way. I know I'd be thinking, what are you getting out of the way of? For if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Holy Spirit called Barnabas. And he called Saul. Out of Antioch. It was a clear call. Go through all of Scripture to see how the Holy Spirit worked and works throughout redemptive history. This gives us a blueprint for Holy Spirit leading and Holy Spirit calling. The separation from service not only involved the calling of the Holy Spirit, but also involved sending of the local church. This was the first agency to send missionaries out. Boards and organizations and what they used to be called missionary societies are a good tool, but ultimately it starts in the church. One of my favorite stories about Mount Zion Baptist Church is a story, and I actually made a video of it a little while back, Called Sylvia Arnold. She got saved right here on this property in 1930. And then she went off to Biola University and, and got a Bible degree. And then she went into government schools in, in Arizona. Okay, it's still on. It looked like it was off. Uh, she went into some government schools in, in Arizona. And I did some research on those. And 
I don't even want to get into the time what, what all that was, but she went there and, and the, the, these were children. A lot of them were orphans. And she witnessed to them. She wrote letters. She traveled around and raised money for different projects. There was a remodel of a girl's dorm that she worked really hard to get money raised for. And she'd get in there and she would, I don't know how many scores of, of children accepted the Lord because she went to some, some obscure town, Page, Arizona. Anyone ever heard of Page, Arizona? She went there and labored for a lot of years. And I don't know what happened to her later in life, but I know she spent a lot of time there sharing, probably doing what we're doing for VBS. She probably did that week in and week out, that kind of, that kind of intensity, I'll just call it. This church in Antioch willingly gave up some of their best leaders and their best workers. We must invest financially and we must invest physically to the cause of Jesus. Throwing money at something doesn't, isn't always the answer. Sometimes we've got to be what, what Brother Mark reminded me of yesterday, being the hands and feet of Jesus. Getting out there, seeing what we can do. Or we've got to move on here. Number three, we see the sending of the saints. Verses uh, 4 through 12 tells us that they were uh, uh, sent out. And then they were sent by the Holy Ghost in verse 4. And they departed uh, uh, unto Cilicia. And then they went to Cyprus. And then they uh, were at Salamis in verse 5. They preached the word of God in the synagogues. Uh, and then it talks about how they, they came across the uh, uh, false prophet, Bar Jesus, which we'll get into him here in a moment. And the trouble he tried to stir up and he tried to turn somebody away. And then you go down to verse 9. Paul had to, he had to have that prayer life where he had the spiritual glasses on where he could say what he said here in, in verse 9. Or excuse me, in verse 10. He said, all, uh, oh, full of all subility, sub, uh, subtil, I can never say that word right, being subtle. And, he, uh, and all mischief. Who does that remind you of? Satan. That's how Satan works. If you find somebody that says, I'm going to do things, but I'm going to be real subtle, I'm going to be real undercover about it, better be careful. Because that's how Satan works. In fact, he even says that, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He says, won't you just stop? In verse 11, he says, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Boy, that scared me. And thou be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a, and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. This guy couldn't even get himself out of a wet paper bag at this point. And he goes on. And when the deputy... Here's what happens with the sending of the saints. And, and people are... are are devoted to the mission. Because, man, it would have been easy to quit. Because I guarantee you, this guy, this Elymas, Bar Jesus, he didn't let up. But Paul didn't let up either. Because here's what happened. Man, when we think something's going bad, man, there's times I've thought, oh, it's going down the tubes, Lord. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden, listen to what happens in verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine or the teaching of the Lord. You know, it's not in my notes, but I want to say something about verse 12 before we talk about anything else here. When you're discouraged, when you're ready to just throw in the towel and quit, you never know who's waiting for you to just keep being faithful. You never know who's waiting for you to just teach that lesson or to sing that song or to clean up that area or whatever it may be. Or somebody that you pick up and bring to church every Sunday. And maybe you don't get a thank you for it. That person needs you. When you go out canvassing, the community needs you to do that. Now they won't say, oh, we need Mount Zion Baptist Church to come and invite us. They're not going to say that. But you know what? According to what God's Word says, they, they need you. Jesus even said, go out of the highways and the byways. By the way, that was before I-44 was even built. Before all, even old Route 66 was built, it says go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Invite them. So the sending of the saints here, we see that there's a team. They went to Cilicia, which is 16 miles south of home, to Salamis on the coast of Cyprus. Now, some of us drive that far. Okay, well, 
the Apostle Paul didn't have a Lincoln Navigator to just get in and say, I'm just going to go to the next place. If, if you had some money, you might have rode an animal. Or you did the real old school thing and you walked. Walk 20 miles in one day. That's, that kind of gives you an estimate of what a day's journey would have been in Scripture. I've walked from Springfield to Bolivar, 34 miles one way. I'm crazy, I know. I had somebody pick me up in Bolivar. And I tell you what, I was tired after that. I didn't do anything for about a day and a half. And go on the Frisco Trail, I wouldn't recommend you necessarily do it alone like I did. But uh, it's kind of interesting. But that's, that has really not a whole lot to do with this. I'm just using that as an illustration to say, well, we see mileage like that in Scripture. Like, that's nothing. I drive that far every day. It's different back then. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7, He said unto uh, him, or He called unto them, excuse me, the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. There was a huge danger of loneliness in the ministry. We need people around us to encourage, support, and walk next to us through a hostile world while working the ministry. The world doesn't say, Oh, I'm so glad that you're coming here to minister. I'm so glad you're doing music ministry at God's Live Baptist Church. Or I'm so glad you're doing sunshiners on Wednesday nights. Or I'm so glad you teach a Sunday school class. If anything, the world's like, Why are you doing that? By the way, Satan can't get you lost tonight, but if he can make you think you're wasting your time here, he's going to try to do that. He'll try to get you discouraged. He sent help, or they send help, excuse me, they were sent with help uh, from Mark, John Mark, who's mentioned here in uh, verse number 5. John Mark was with them as their personal assistant. Whatever needed to be done, that was his task on this missionary journey. If they needed some food, he would go and get the food. If they uh, had a need to a place to stay, he would go out and secure a place to stay. In 1989, John Engel wrote uh, boomers, and future, boomers and the Future of World Missions. He says, A generation of American Christians has given obediently and generously. By the way, this is back in 1989. He writes this. Unfortunately, they have aged. Here in the conclusion... Or here is a conclusion which cannot be ignored. It is highly unlikely that this aging financial base in North America can support accelerated world evangelism. The slack must be picked up or taken up by younger Christians. He said that all the way back in 1989. That's part of why VBS is important. If you teach a Sunday school class with somebody that's younger uh, than 18 and below, we need you. Because that's, the few, that's what's going to get people saved. That's what John Ingalls writing about in 1989. These people face satanic oppression here in uh, Acts 13. After traveling 115 miles now, they meet a sorcerer who pretends to be a prophet. His real name mean, is, was Bar-Jesus, which means the son of Jesus. Can you imagine that? It doesn't really surprise me a whole lot because we have a lot of craziness and nonsense that goes on today. This guy is going around saying, you heard of Jesus? Well, I'm his son. It was a little harder to do fact-checking back then than it is now. You couldn't go find his birth certificate down at the local county records. That didn't exist. We should not be surprised or shaken by opposition. Charles Spurgeon said this about opposition. He said, Wherever there is likely to be great success, the open door and the opposing adversaries will both be found. He goes on to say this, If there are no adversaries, you may fear that there will be no success. And listen to what he says here to wrap up his statement about adversity and opposition. He says, A boy cannot get his kite up without the wind, nor without a wind which drives against his kite. You know, if I'm trying to fly a kite, man, it, it, it may be hard. You ever flown a kite in a high wind before? It's been a few years since I've done that. And man, sometimes it's hard. It's like, I can't get that thing up there. And the thing I used to hate what would happen, I'd get that kite up there and the wind would just knock it down. Like, why won't my kite fly? Well, once I got some slack out of it and I got it going, then it was like it was flying me. Elemis was intelligent and smart. He knew how to combat the influence of the Word of God. 
Now notice the intent of this man, which is the intent of all false teachers. He sought to turn away the governor from the faith. See these men here, even in the force of opposition here, they experience God's mighty power. Paul's experience in verse 9 and Paul's boldness in verse 10. Paul was given discernment about the sorcerer. Paul himself did not have discernment about this. But Paul himself saw through the lies. He saw through the false teacher here. Part of why we go through and we've taught doctrine and 18 lessons of discipleship. Some of it is because I want you to help people follow the Lord. But some of it is because... I want you to see false teaching when it comes. I want you to be able to recognize um, that doesn't line up with this. In the Old Testament, there's a book that says, I think it's in uh, Hosea, about people being destroyed because of lack of knowledge. We've got some quotes up here. Pray for the USA. The lost light matter most. The USA and, and, and the lost, there's lack of knowledge right now. You wonder why we've got problems that we have. We have a, a, a political system that's messed up. That's probably the kindest way I can put it tonight. I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can. But a lot of it's no lack of knowledge. A lot of it's because we have people that don't know history. George Santa Anna once said, those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it. And we aren't studying our history like we should as a nation, but that's, i got to move on. Paul had boldness. He talks about in uh, Philippians, about the boldness. He says in Philippians 2, 15-16, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, and in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Sounds a lot like where we're at, doesn't it? Quit, wicked and perverse. Listen carefully what he says here. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. How do I hold forth the word of life? Right here. Get in it, study it, live it. And he goes on to say that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The sorcerer is blinded in verse 11. Carnality, or excuse me, certainly, I don't know why I thought that word was carnality. Probably my, my contacts are acting up. Uh, certainly those who are resisting God are blind spiritually. So God is just giving Elymas a spiritual blindness corresponding to his uh, physical blindness, excuse me, corresponding to his spiritual blindness. However, we never hear Elymas repenting. You know, Paul was blinded. You know, that back, we read about that a few chapters back. The Apostle Paul gets blinded. Very similar here. Paul couldn't find his way out of a wet paper bag when he got blinded. People had to leave him to town. Paul, as a result of his blindness, realized how spiritually he was blinded and he repented and turned toward the Lord. This guy, Elymas, and he probably looked for the best remedy he could find for his blindness. We don't know what happened to him. I think he died as a blind man personally. 2 Samuel 15.31 And uh, one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. I mentioned him a little bit this morning. Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And if you're familiar with the story there, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, uh, there there was some strife and division, I'm sure, in that family. And David said, listen how David said this. Here's how David prayed for one of his enemies. Ahithophel was one of his enemies. Ahithophel was a man that advised David, but listen to what he said, I pray thee. He says, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. That's all he said. There's nothing wrong, by the way, if, if somebody's wicked, just praying that their plans don't, don't go out as planned. It's okay. He didn't pray for anything bad to happen to Ahithophel. He just prayed that the plans would just be foolishness and no one would listen to him and carry him out. And they got to see their con- first convert to Jesus. The deputy saw the courage of Paul. Paul stands with conviction, bold in his belief and willing to make a stand for Jesus. That made a difference here. The deputy sees what happens to Elymas' sin and his physical blindness, which corresponded with the spiritual blindness. If, we, if only we would see more 
of the trouble sin gets people into, we might run harder after the things of God. You know, Matthew 7, 28-29, and we're almost done. I know I went a little long tonight, I apologize. But uh, Matthew 7, 28-29 says, It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine, for He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. You know, the scribes were, were leaders here, but they weren't leading very well. In closing, one afternoon, author Patsy Claremont found herself on an airplane sitting next to a young man. Um, she writes, I have already observed something about this young man when I was uh, being seated. He called me ma'am. At the time, I thought, either he thinks I'm ancient, or he's from the south where they still teach manners, or he's in the service. She said, I decided the latter was the most likely. So I asked, are you in the service? And he says, yes ma'am, I am. And she said, what branch? And he said, the Marines. And... uh, um, and then somebody said, Hey, Marine, where are you coming from? Operation Desert Storm. And no kidding, Desert Storm, how long have you been there? She asked him. A year and a half. I'm on my way home. My family will be at the airport. And then Patsy Claremont said uh, that she uh, commented that he must have thought about uh, returning to his family and home so many times while he was in the Middle East. He said, Oh, no, ma'am. He replied, We were taught to never... We were taught never to think of what might never be, but to be fully available right where we were. In other words, his, his duty and task consumed his time and his energy tonight. And as we close, missions in action. There, there's a part for everyone to play. It's not just the pastor. It's not just a, a, a Sunday school teacher, but every single one of us has a role to play. There's somebody God wants you to reach that, that I, I can't reach, that no one else can reach. But God wants to use you, your personality, your likes and your dislikes, all of that. Help us to be a church on the move and to be doing missions in action. Let's pray.